Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Schneider, for that uh, generous introduction, and both of the institutions that you plugged, I'm sure, would appreciate that uh, as well. Um, ah, we got the new one on the screen. Uh, Americans bring some distinctive uh, perspectives to uh, the subject of this uh, conference, hard and soft power. And so my particular subject is how some of the relevant, peculiarly American perspectives toward that topic grow out of the history and geography and other circumstances of the United States and of the political culture uh, that grows out of those circumstances. I'm not talking about what any one administration or presidency does, although obviously we see a lot of variation uh, from one to the other. I'm talking about uh, what Americans as a whole, uh, how they tend to see things. And by perspectives toward hard and soft power, that being my topic, I mean not only preferences for using certain forms of power over other, but, but also perceptions about the consequences. Uh, and sometimes difficulties associated with such use. Let me start by throwing out two major aspects, one bad and one good, about the place of the United States in the world. The bad one is anti-Americanism, which, as I think you all know, is all too prevalent in many parts of the world, in public discourse and to varying degrees in the rhetoric and sometimes the policies of governments in those parts of the world. The other aspect, the good one, is just how attractive the United States is as a place to live. Among those who don't live here but would love to have the chance to do that if they could. These two aspects, the negative and the positive, often coexist in the very same parts of the world and sometimes coexist in the same individuals. People who have lots of critical things to say about the United States, but they'd still love to hear live here if they had the chance. The positive side of this, you know, what makes it attractive to be here in America, is certainly one of the bigger elements of soft power that the United States has. It is this country's image of, based on the reality of, this country as a land of prosperity and freedom. The negative side, the anti-Americanism, has a combination of causes the relative importance of which tends to get debated, especially when people debate about what it is that causes other peoples to get so extreme in their anti-Americanism that they might resort to violence, especially terrorist violence. Well, some of the causes have to do with the U.S.'s status as the sole superpower. The U.S. is able, more than any other country, to do more things that more people around the globe perceive, rightly or wrongly, as threatening or destructive, because it has the power to do so. The causes also have to do with particular U.S. policies, policies that make use of that ability to do more things around the globe that can be perceived as threatening or destructive. Now, some of America's global influence that becomes a source of resentment in certain parts of the world could be labeled as soft power. And I'm referring specifically to the export of popular culture and consumerism that some people abroad, especially in the Muslim world, resent as cultural imperialism. But to a much greater degree, the causes of the resentment and sometimes even anger that underlie the anti-Americanism have to do with the exercise of hard power and particularly that quintessential form of hard, hard power, military force. So how do most Americans perceive all this? I don't mean the intellectual elite, those of you who are in a room like this. I mean Americans in general, the public in general. Well, the attractive side of the United States, um, the part that positively attracts uh, foreigners, is something that I think most Americans simply take for granted. Of course, America is a land of prosperity and freedom. Moreover, it's a land of immigrants, so it hardly comes as news that just as America has been a magnet over previous generations for many immigrants, it continues to be a magnet for many present-day would-be or wannabe immigrants. 
Now, whether or not this is regarded as a form of soft power, and I dare say once you get beyond the intellectual elite, the term soft power is not in the active vocabulary of most Americans. Um, it is not a form of power that seems to require the United States to do anything. The United States just is. To the extent that Americans talk about having to do something related to the attractiveness of this country to foreigners who would like to live here, the talk tends to be focused on controlling the movement of such people, that is to say, policing illegal immigration. Most Americans have difficulty perceiving and understanding the negative side the resentment and even anger sometimes among foreigners that stems from the United States exercising its power, especially hard power, and above all, military force. They see their own motives as pure. So they have a hard time understanding the perceptual side effects of the exercise of hard power. They focus instead in a direct, straightforward way of what we can accomplish by using an instrument like military force. Well, several attributes of the history and circumstances of the United States contribute, I think, to these particular perceptual habits and shortcomings. One is that the United States has never been threatened, really seriously threatened, by the power of someone much more powerful than itself. The protective advantage of those two moats that are known as the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean have been among the biggest shapers of American attitudes about the exercise of power and what it means. When the Republic was young and not very powerful, the country that then was most able to project power, and this goes back to something that Charlie Cupchan mentioned at, near the beginning of his talk, namely Britain with its Royal Navy tended to do so in ways that contributed to, rather than threatened, the prosperity of the new North American Republic. When a more mature United States finally began flexing its own global muscle around the turn of the 20th century, it was already a match for anyone else. The most serious physical threat to the United States was the USSR during the Cold War and the nuclear age. But the Soviet Union was never more than a co-equal second superpower, and even at that, one that would prove, in fact, to be the inferior of the United States when Ronald Reagan declared in the 1980s a race for turning economic power into military power. Because of these happy circumstances, Americans tend to be insensitive to how those not similarly blessed will be attuned to the threatening side of the exercise of power by those more powerful than themselves, and how such exercise may come to be resented or even hated. The United States in this regard is the antithesis of, say, Belgium or Poland or countless other countries that have had to be so attuned because it, matters of national survival are at stake. What their very neighbors might do threatens national survival. Because Americans have never been in a similar position, they are slow to perceive and slow to understand how others may perceive the exercise of US power as threatening. The United States also has not had the experience, as the European powers in the 18th and 19th centuries had, of engaging in a form of balance of power politics in which, for the most part, the motives of the different players were basically indistinguishable, except for nationality and language. They were all trying to secure territory and resources and still more power to secure more territory and more resources and more wealth. When the United States finally stepped onto that playing field in World War I, it was with the declared mission of ending that balance of power game rather than indulging in it itself. So Americans find it easy to see their country as the city on the hill as something fundamentally different from other powers and acting out of motives more noble than those of others. This is the base, basis for many aspects of American exceptionalism. But for our current purposes, the point is, it is also a basis for Americans to find it difficult to understand how foreigners can ever perceive as less than noble America's motives in exercising power, especially hard power. It does not naturally occur to most Americans, for example, that the use of military force in the Muslim world would be perceived, however incorrectly, 
by many in that world as undertaken to kill Muslims, occupy their lands, and plunder their wealth, as many, in fact, incorrectly but fervently believe. Most of the adversaries the United States has faced in its great applications of hard power in the 20th century, the two world wars, especially World War II and the Cold War, uh, were against adversaries, they were adversaries that were certifiably bad in the sense that they are generally perceived today as representing ideologies or systems of government that it was right to use power to defeat military hard power. And this history has bolstered Americans' sense of their own motives in applying military force, seeing those motives as being of a higher order than those of others who have applied it. Americans have not had to overcome, or at least they don't think they've had to overcome, episodes in their own history similar to those our German and Japanese friends have had to overcome regarding the regimes that controlled their countries before and during World War II and the way those regimes applied hard power to the detriment and suffering of many others. Even a recent U.S. instigated war of aggression, the one launched against Iraq in 2003, is not seen in anything near the same terms, despite ample disagreement among Americans today as to how that particular use of military power should be judged and, and perceived. The United States has had one of the longest continuous histories in the world of more or less stable political life based on firmly entrenched and broadly shared values, the ones embodied in a constitution and a bill of rights that were written way back in the 18th century. Whatever soft power is embodied in that constitution and those values, it's not something Americans have had to work at, or at least they, they believe, most Americans believe, that they don't have to work at it. It's another part of that American experience that just seems to have come naturally. Even the one big bloody interruption to that experience, the American Civil War, is seen as a reaffirmation of those values since, after all, the anti-slavery side won and the Union was preserved. So again, most Americans see soft power involved as a matter less of doing something than of merely being. Now there are those whom Walter Russell Meade would label Jeffersonians who don't see it that way. They believe this aspect of American soft power does require work to make sure it's not lost but these people tend to be in the minority here in the United States. A final relevant aspect of American history and the habits of thought it has nurtured about the application of power is just how successful the United States has been in so many of the endeavors it has undertaken, from winning world wars to putting a man on the moon. This experience has nurtured an American confidence that with enough dedication, resources, and know-how, the United States can accomplish just about anything. Setbacks are taken not as a lesson, not to try the same sort of thing again, but instead as a stimulus to fix whatever needs to be fixed so we can do a better job of it next time. This outlook characterizes most American attitudes about the application of military force. We see it today with the expedition in Afghanistan and how comparisons are drawn to the experience in Iraq. My friend Mark Lynch of George Washington University is quoted in a piece in the most recent Economist that talks about the United, the United States and the Middle East. And Mark describes the prevailing American attitude uh, this way. The lesson we seem to have learned from Iraq is not disaster, don't do it again, but rather now we know how to do counterinsurgency, end of quote. Much of the debate over policy toward Afghanistan right now is a kind of engineer's discussion over what strategy, tactics, and resources and people are required to stabilize that country, rather than a discussion about more fundamental questions about the purposes and applications of power. And there's been relatively little examination of the roles and relative strengths and weaknesses of hard and soft forms of power as applied to the original purpose of the expedition having to do with counterterrorism. I'm not saying those discussions are not held inside uh, the U.S. government and inside um, our organizations that are trying to perform the mission in Afghanistan, I'm making a comment more about the general discourse and debate among the American public. The characteristically American engineer's outlook as applied to, to soft power tends to focus more on messaging rather than on the underlying substance. And we see this in the perpetual hand-wringing for years and years that's gone on here in Washington over public diplomacy. Uh, it's long been perceived by many people as broken in need of fixing, although there's always lots of disagreement as to just how to fix it. 
hands are wrung because of the disconnect between the basic goodness that Americans see in their own country and the anti-Americanism that they see overseas. Many who disagree about the best techniques to employ in public diplomacy in effect agree on the idea that if we can just do a better job of getting our message across, the sentiment overseas is bound to change. It's all just a question of finding the right technique to get the message across. Fewer people engaged in the debate point out that messaging can only do so much and that whether you are selling toothpaste or foreign policy, the substance and quality of the product matters at least as much as the advertising. Let me end by summing up the uh, characteristically American attitude sort of soft and hard power as follows. Soft power tends to be seen in this country as an asset, but exactly that, as an asset more than as a policy instrument to be actively manipulated um, and bolstered. It is seen as flowing out of America's essential goodness rather than out of any concerted effort apart from messaging to shape whatever it is that gives rise to the soft power in the first place and can be used as a tool of influence. It is, in short, taken for granted more than it is seen as something in need of nurturing and shaping. And one implication, I think, of this is that the United States probably does not gain as much influence from its soft power as it could with more concentrated attention to the subject. On the hard power side, the United States exhibits an overall bias toward the instruments of hard power, especially military power. This is not because Americans are militarists. They are not. They see this particular tool as one they have necessarily unsheathed from time to time to do battle with foreign threats that raise their ugly heads. And after those threats are disposed of, we resheathe that particular instrument. The bias exists, first, because of the insufficient appreciation of the role of soft power. Second, because of the signal successes, such as winning World War II, that have come directly from using this hard power tool. Third, because of enough confidence in America's ability to accomplish what it sets out to accomplish overseas, such that Americans are not permanently discouraged by lack of success, such as the Vietnam War. And fourth, because of insufficient ability, I mean, they're discouraged for a while. We had the Vietnam War, Nam War syndrome, but we kind of recovered from that, didn't we? And fourth, because of insufficient ability, for the reasons I've mentioned, to perceive and understand the broader side effects of the U.S. use of military force, particularly regarding the perceptions and affinities of foreign populations. And an implication of that is that a greater understanding of those side effects would represent, in my judgment, one of the most significant ways in which discourse about U.S. foreign policy could be improved. I'll end there, and I look forward to any of your comments.